Atlanta was always set to be one of a kind. By enlisting an insanely talented cast of creatives, including his brother Stephen Glover and frequent collaborator Hiro Mirai, Donald Glover's show became so much more than what was promised to audiences. Though the show was often funny, it was decidedly not a sitcom. Instead, audiences received an Afro-surrealist drama with a tendency for existentialism. Additionally, while the show's overarching plot remained about Donald Glover's character, Earn, as he manages his cousin Al's hip-hop career as the rapper Paperboy, this aspect of the characters' lives is rarely the focus of the individual episodes. The show functions through a series of glimpses into the lives of the many characters, or even into the off-put world they exist in. Joining Al and Earn, the main cast also includes Darius, Al's odd but often wise best friend, and Van, Earn's on-again, off-again girlfriend who he has a child with. Through all four characters, the show explores different topics related to existentialism. Though, through the characters of Earn and Al, Atlanta explores the limited ways in which we could define ourselves, in an existential sense, under capitalism. Thus, illustrating how our sense of identity is controlled by the financial model. In understanding this, we, as viewers, become more aware of the relationship between our sense of identity and said system, as well as better equipped to work around its constraints to define ourselves. Because I define myself according to my subscriber count, please consider subscribing. Now, to best understand how the show does this, it's important to start with a proper understanding of the two concepts. According to existentialist theory, individuals have agency over defining who they are through acts of free will. Our identity is shaped by our experiences, how we react to these experiences, our decisions, and our actions. We must therefore work to define ourselves. Simply put, we exist before we are defined. Hence, existentialism. This is opposed to the philosophical theory that is essentialism, which states that we are born with an essence that will define who we are moving forward. Of course, with such a broad theory, there are many different branches to existentialism, though these are not necessary to understand how our ability to define ourselves is limited under a capitalist system. Capitalism is the economic model the current world functions under, though some countries may be in further stages of capitalism than others, even countries that we may call socialists or communists are capitalist, especially as they function under the global economic model. Under capitalism, the market is controlled by privately owned companies that operate for profit. It is understood that all entities, whether they are corporate or individual, must operate with the goal of generating capital. The worker therefore serves to create the product or service that may then be monetized for as much value as possible. As this is the goal under the capitalist model, this also becomes the individual's aim. Therefore, success, in a capitalist sense, is measured by the individual's ability to accumulate wealth. This inherently means that income should come before all else. In his 2009 book Capitalist Realism, is there no alternative? British political theorist Mark Fisher discusses the notion that most of us are unable to imagine a reality without capitalism. According to Fisher, capitalism has such a powerful hold on our world that we widely believe it to be the only applicable political and economic system. He builds on this by explaining that, as capitalism functions as the global economic model, and has for so long, we are unable to even picture an alternative. It is easier to imagine an end to the world than an end to capitalism, he writes. To expand onto this, if we as individuals are unable to imagine reality separate from capitalism, we are equally unable to imagine ourselves separate from this model. Therefore, it is understood that most individuals observe themselves under a capitalist lens, using the ability to succeed within its conditions as a measure of value. More than just using our financial status as an identifier of our worth, it has become part of our identity. This is obvious in many facets of our life. We refer to our jobs as what we do for a living, 
essentially equating making money to being alive. The implication becomes that our life has no value once we stop generating wealth. How often do we hear people talk about how they can't imagine retiring, as they can't imagine going so long without work? Again, the implication is that we become useless once we stop working. There are multiple other things you can do during that time that will feel productive to you. Capitalism has clearly become such an overwhelming presence in our reality that we have become unable to separate from it. I had a weird dream. I was swimming in this pool, but it was like the ocean, and I was swimming with the seaweed, but it wasn't seaweed, it was, it's like hands. And I was swimming with this girl, and she was saying if the hands grab you, they pull you down and drown you, so I'll swim above them. Atlanta's introductory episode serves to establish the relationship between the characters, as well as their relationship with their own sense of identity. When first introduced to Earn, the audience is introduced to a Princeton dropout desperately trying to get people to sign up for the credit card company he works for. Ern is broke, has nowhere to stay, has a young daughter to take care of, and is all but homeless. He feels as though there are no opportunities available to him at this time, but this changes when one of his colleagues shows him the new music video by a local hip-hop artist. Paperboy by Paperboy. As Ern recognizes the rapper as his cousin Alfred, he also recognizes his shot for a way out of what he views as a dead-end path. He leaves his shift to find his cousin, hoping to become his manager. When Ern finally reaches his cousin, Al immediately calls him out on being there for money. It's obvious to the viewer that the two haven't been close for some time. Ern had to ask his parents where his cousin lived. And Al mentions that they haven't seen each other since his mother's funeral. He knows that if Ern is trying to enter his life again, it has to do with Paperboy's success and a desire to capitalize on it. The problem is, unlike Ern, Al seems satisfied with the way he's living. His music is making him enough money to get his immediate needs and wants, so he doesn't feel a need to make substantially more. He's unwilling to agree to his cousin's proposition if he feels his cousin is only in it for himself. Already, the two characters have established separate relationships with the capitalist system. Ern, currently, is in a position where his needs are not being met. He works a job where he's both underpaid and undervalued, while all other aspects of his life seem to be equally unsatisfactory. Ern feels as though he objectively failed. Additionally, it is revealed to the viewer that he's been quite distant from his family ever since he left Princeton. In fact, he hasn't told any of them what caused him to leave. This is an early indicator that he's rather self-conscious of the way he's perceived. He doesn't want to share a story that details his failure, even to those close to him. To earn, it's not only about being successful, but being viewed as successful. Meanwhile, though Alfred doesn't seem to have much going on outside of his music career when it comes to work, he has everything he needs for the time being. His social life seems to be decent as well. The best way to describe Al, at this point, is satisfied. He feels as though he's achieved what he wants, at least for now. Ern convinces him that there could be more for him he could have a longer-lasting impact financially and maybe even on a more individual scale. So, by the end of the episode, he hires Ern to be his manager. Our first hint that he may be searching for more, even if he doesn't know it yet. Oh, I love this. You look like the future. Oh, stop, stop, stop. stop. Hey. <laughs> and who's this? Oh. This is my new friend. Do you like your old friend? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> this is Al. Hello. Hey, y'all. Hey. Come find me. Hey. Who's this? Baby, Baby this boy. is New Jazz. Ah, New Jazz. Please, come in. I'm gonna... By the time season three starts, 
Alfred has already started seeing what Vetmore can be. Both he and Ern's careers seem to be quite successful. The rapper lives a far more lavish lifestyle, as Paperboy is an international celebrity with a European tour taking place. Of course, both Darius and Ern join him on his tour. It's no secret that, though Alfred and Ern are family, there's a substantial financial element to their close relationship. Without the Paperboy persona, Ern would not be the music manager he is now. His career relies on his cousin, whom he profits from, much like a private company benefits from the worker's output. And so, Al is unsure if he can trust Ern. The fear that his cousin is only in it for himself which Al had in the first episode, is still present and creates tension in their relationship. He feels used by his cousin. After all, the capitalist system encourages the individual to gain as much capital as possible, and for Earn to maximize capital as a manager, this must come at the expense of his client. For all extensive purposes, Ernest is now part of the exploitive music industry. Both cousins are aware of this. But, at the start of New Jazz, Alfred comes to realize that his relationship with Darius may also have taken a financial turn, when his best friend suddenly expects him to pay both their bills at a cafe in Amsterdam. Obviously, with his current success, it isn't the cost of the bill that bothers Alfred. It's the fact that Darius clearly had no intention on paying. And then, not long later, this essentially repeats itself as Darius doesn't have enough money on him to purchase the space cake he plans on taking with Al. He states that it's alright, and that he'll leave it for fate, then waits until Alfred pays for it. His fear of being taken advantage of by those around him has increased. He knew from the start that Ern was in it for the money, but this was not something he expected from his best friend. Al is recognizing that his closest relationships have become transactional. With the two people closest to Alfred becoming dependent on his finances, the rapper feels as though he's losing control over his relationships and his own life, especially as one of those people has a level of control over his finances. Al feels as though his identity is being lost and shaped by those around him. Again. This reinforces the notion that, under capitalist realism, we have a hard time separating our identity from its place in the capitalist model. Alfred feels as though he has no say over who he is because he has no control over his money. This is expanded upon as Alfred starts to bad trip due to the Nepalese space cake. His fears start to manifest. As Darius wanders off without him, the rapper is left alone in a city he does not know on a substance he's never tried. He is soon found by a woman named Lorraine. Upon meeting her, she tells him that she hates rappers like him, as they don't know themselves. You have no idea where your money is. And I, I watch y'all's interviews, you know, you're wearing all that designer, and I mean, you look cute, it's no shade or whatever, do your thing, but you still have no clue where your money is. She tells him, using this as proof that she's right, he doesn't know himself. This serves as confirmation that Alfred equates his own being to his finances. By the end of the episode, it's implied that Lorraine never existed. She was a hallucination caused by his bad trip. Therefore, when he's told that he doesn't know himself because he doesn't know where his money is, this isn't something that's said by a stranger. It's something he's telling himself, because he observes himself through the lens of his financial status. This fear is only heightened when Lorraine asks him who owns his masters, a question he can't answer. He never really thought to look into it. These manifestations of his fears continue to grow as Lorraine takes the rapper to a mysterious club, which he soon discovers is a club for cancelled celebrities. Here. Almus faces insecurities regarding his relevance. He fears that he will have no true lasting impact on the world around him, and that he will soon be removed from the limelight. Alfred knows that at any moment, it can all be taken away by the same public that has given him his career. Al continues to grasp for any semblance of control he could get. 
This feeling that he lacks control only deepens when the club calls him to perform on stage, right as Lorraine sneaks him out. He tells her he could have simply refused to do so, but she assures him he cannot say no in this situation. They would have made him perform for their benefit, just as he performs for the benefit of Ern and everyone else around him, with little to no say in the matter. Again, we see that Al feels as though he exists to benefit others who do not care for what is best for him. This is further confirmed when Lorraine tells him, Your friends, your friends let you wear that shit hat. They don't pay for shit. You got family handling the most important parts of your fucking finances? My nigga, your future? All of them, all of them got a vested interest in you not seeing the truth. You don't trust me? His high then takes a turn for the worst, as he finds himself becoming the homeless man he ignored earlier in the episode, and watches his past self begin the journey he had just been on. He is helpless to stop the path others are putting him on. He can only watch as his identity, finances, and life are decided for him. He fears for his career and the lasting impact he will have, but does not see what he can do about it, so long as he lets others have such a powerful say over his career. He wakes in a hotel room with Ern, who found him on the street. The rapper asks who owns the masters to his music, and his cousin reassures him that they remain his. It's unclear if Ern is telling the truth or lying to keep him pleased, but this indicates that Al wants to be more active in controlling his career, finances, and life moving forward. Though the episode illustrates the fears Al has regarding his career, it is also very reflective of how he perceives himself. Al's identity is shaped by his career and finances, though he's clearly searching for more. He recognizes that both these elements are completely out of his control, and that by letting them shape him, he will never truly have control over his sense of self. However, he is not equipped to operate outside of these constraints. Therefore, he searches to define himself within them. His version of making sure he, as an individual, exists for reasons other than the benefit of those around him, is to take control of his career and finances. In doing so, he does break free from their control but he remains stuck within the system that put him in this position. He is still defined by his ability to generate wealth. However, it is now for himself instead of others. I'm good, man. I'm good. Well, bam. Thank you, man. You know it. Entering Season 4, it seems Alfred has more of a say over his finances and career, as the core trio of the series seem to be doing their own thing at this point. After a performance, Paperboy is offered a million dollars to help a young rich kid get his musical career started, but even though the kid's father was impressed enough to make this offer, the kid isn't. He and his friends tell the rapper he's someone they used to listen to. They don't really seem to care for his input. Al very suddenly has to face the notion that his relevance in the hip-hop scene is fading. Additionally, he's told by another rapper hired for the same purpose that he's being underpaid for the work he's doing. The money he's currently making pales in comparison to the money he can make. Although Al now has control over his finances on a personal level, he must recognize the external factors that affect them are out of his control. It doesn't matter how good an album he puts out, or how talented he is. As a musician, his relevance with the youth will always be something he depends on. When this relevance starts to fade, so will his earnings. As Al's self is defined, in his eyes, by his wealth and his career, both these elements must continue to grow. Currently, the reverse is happening. He is being forgotten, and he is being paid less than what he can. Therefore, he is defined as less complete than he should be. He must find ways to adapt to the changing climate, or find new ways to exist within it. 
At first, he's resistant to this idea, insisting that he can make another album, win a Grammy, and make just as much money as before. Though, he's quickly convinced this is wrong. Therefore, he searches for other methods of expanding his capital, trying to find a new young artist he can manage for personal profit. At this moment, the illusion of control is created for Paperboy. He believes that he oversees his identity as he's not the subject of the exploitation anymore. Instead, he exploits Yolo Kid, the young artist he signed. Again, this is the illusion of control because though he believes he's broken out of the exploitative relationship he had with the music industry, all that's really happened is his position within it switched. He is still part of this industry and still serves this exploitative nature. But by switching the role he plays within this industry, he brings his career as a manager further than he ever could his career as an artist. Yodel Kid's album, Born to Die, goes platinum in three weeks and even wins a Grammy under Al's management, an achievement Paperboy never did on his own. However, the young artist is not there to accept his Grammy. He died of overdose that very day. Throughout the episode, it was apparent that Yolo Kid has a substance abuse problem, but Al is never seen showing much concern for how it affects the young artist, despite being his mentor. He does show concern for how it affects him, telling Yolo Kid not to throw up in his car, and trying to bring him back to focus during conversations. However, as this does not hurt his stream of revenue, there's no incentive for him to change the young artist's behavior. Especially as it seems part of Yolo Kid's mass appeal was his lifestyle. To change this would therefore be to get in the way of his own money. Though Al never says it, it's pretty obvious that he feels a level of responsibility and guilt for what happened. He tells his cousin that he isn't fit for the work of a music manager. Ern tells him that the business is not about how he feels, but what survives. An answer that doesn't seem to satisfy Al. Al has recognized that by operating under the capitalist model, he must exist as the exploited or the exploiting. Additionally, he becomes increasingly aware that these two are not mutually exclusive. On paper, the rapper should be happy. He worked on a Grammy winning album and has made more money than he ever could through his own musical career. However, he's unsatisfied. He does not want to remain defined by the system he is operating under, and has recognized that so long as he allows it to influence his vision of himself, he will continue to search to define himself within its constraints. If he hopes to characterize himself on a deeper level, he must look outside of his wealth and his career. Alfred's journey of self-definition is one that is often guided by monetary gain. When the character is originally presented to the audience, he's satisfied with his lifestyle. By the end of the series, however, the character has been on the search for a larger impact. This is reflected in his desire for greater control over his musical career, as well as the idea of the legacy he will leave behind. However, these concepts are manifested through monetary gain for most of the series, leaving the character greatly unsatisfied. It is only once he recognizes the limitation of this approach that he reaches an end that is truly satisfying. In the second to last episode, we see the character at peace with his status as a marijuana farmer, largely secluded from the outside world. He does this as he finds the task rewarding, instead of for the money and fame it could provide. He is at peace doing what he enjoys, and understands his needs and desires at this moment. The viewer understands that what was preventing Al from finding this peace was his need to define himself through his finances. However, the viewer also understands that 
Alfred cannot operate the way he currently does had he not previously accumulated substantial wealth. Is the luxury of operating outside the capitalist model one that is solely reserved to those who could afford it? Oh, and I got you another one of those boo-boo shirts. It was on sale. Don't say I never did anything for you. Thanks. Whereas the viewer's understanding of Al's attempts to define himself under capitalism starts with the Big Bang, we also learn that Ern has been struggling in his efforts to define himself through the financial model since he was a child. Ern has, for a large part of his life, been hyper aware of the perception others have of him, especially as a black man in America. Ern must operate under a system that is both capitalist and racist. His mother kept him aware of the perception many will have of him due to his race, which, in turn, made him very self-conscious. He recognizes that the average black man and white man in America are not always treated with the same level of respect and dignity. In fact, they very often are not, especially as the capitalist model has a long history of exploiting black peoples for profit. Racial capitalism proposes that Capitalism can only function through extreme inequality between different human groups, something we may recognize through the class system, though it has historically been even more pronounced through racial divisions, especially in America, where industrial capitalism was founded on slavery and continues to operate that way through the prison system. The Punishment Clause of the 13th Amendment allows for forced labor, or slave work, as a punishment for crime. However, this is not the only aspect of this foundation that is still echoed through modern America. As capitalism continues to exploit the working class, being particularly exploitive of immigrants who often find themselves with limited options. The generational effects of racial exploitation under capitalism have also left minority groups, particularly black people, in disadvantageous socioeconomic positions, leaving them more vulnerable to exploitation in current time. While racial capitalism certainly affected Alfred as well, especially as a member of the music industry, Ern's awareness of the situation since a young age causes it to play a much larger role in his existentialist journey. As a result, Ern knows that being successful is not enough to receive proper treatment. As much as he wants to achieve success, Ern wants this success to be perceived, as he's more likely to be treated equally in this case. This desire to be perceived as successful, or high status, is visible when he wears his FUBU branded shirt to school after finding it on sale at Marshall's. Ern is proud of the more expensive piece of clothing which his family would normally be unable to afford, and wants those around him to notice it. This returns to his insecurities presented in the first episode. Ern's true perception of himself is through the lens of others. Others view success through a capitalist lens because it's the system we function under. Even in his middle school, this is apparent. When another kid shows up with a slightly different version of the same shirt, indicating that one of them is wearing a fake, both characters start being relentlessly bullied by the children around them. Ern is even told that the girl he has a crush on would not like him, as she doesn't date broke boys. In fact, the bullying is so relentless that the other child, who has some additional struggles at home, takes his life that night. We see through this episode the hold capitalism has on the individual characters, but also the hold it has on a collective level. There's a reason Ern is so insistent on being perceived as successful. He knows how important that perception is. Ern, I know it can be hard to disconnect, but we can't have productive sessions with your cell phone on, Ern. It's important. I can't pay for this if I don't do this. You seem frustrated. I am. I'm having heart troubles, and my doctor is telling me I need to get my head checked. That sounds serious. I hope I can help, but to do so, we can't have distractions. By the end of the series, very little has changed when it comes to the way Ern perceives himself. 
Even as he's built his wealth and his more successful career as a music manager, Earn is unsatisfied with simply having the status he has worked to obtain. He wants to be treated accordingly. He has equated individual worth with the treatment received by others. Knowing the history of discrimination he's faced until now, as well as what happened in his childhood, can we blame him? His perception of self becomes most obvious in his invitation to be a speaker at Princeton, the university that had expelled him some years prior. He accepts this invitation under the condition that they give him an honorary degree. He admits that it holds no real value, and that he can't use it. In fact, he recognizes that, financially, he's better off than he would have been had he stayed there. The honorary degree, therefore, only serves the purpose of elevating his ego. He can now make demands from the school that once expelled him. In discussing his expulsion with his therapist, Ern admits that the most hurtful part of his dismissal was the notion that the accusations laid against him came from a friend. A white woman who accused him of betraying her trust by breaking into her dorm. The situation was far more nuanced, however, the school acted according to this series of events. We once again understand that white and black men are not perceived the same way by the institutions in power. Ern is once again reminded of this. His therapist builds on this revelation, comparing it to other moments during which his trust was betrayed. Notably, when he was abused by a relative. He notes that what seems to hurt Ern most in these instances is the feeling that he's powerless to prevent moments like this from happening to him. This builds on our understanding of Ern. It illustrates that what he really searches for is a semblance of control. If he can control the way he's perceived, he can possibly control the way he's treated, preventing moments like these from happening again. In turn, this is the root of his need to succeed under the capitalist model. He believes that, so long as he succeeds, he will objectively have larger influence than others, proving himself to be more powerful. He even admits this to his therapist, telling him that spite has been one of his primary motivators ever since. He tells his therapist it has given him courage, and that he has promised himself he would prove everyone wrong. He claims to have succeeded in doing so. Ern feels as though he's better defining himself by making a point in proving to others that he is not the version of himself they believe him to be. To a certain extent, there's validity to this. He is not willing to conform to the notions others have of him. However, He's failing to define himself for his own sake. His attempt to define himself is reactionary in nature, and therefore exists simply to prove others wrong, not to satisfy his own need for meaning. You do not need to be a mental health professional to know that this is unhealthy. As his therapist tells him, Spike can be Spite can be very powerful, but it can also leave you depressed and empty. Goals stop becoming yours, start becoming a, a book written by somebody else. This is possibly the best way to look at her. As much as he tries to write his own book, he's so preoccupied by making it a response to others that he doesn't write it for himself. Returning to the capitalist lens of this, as we observe one another through capitalism, he is defining himself to others by proving he could succeed in said system. Despite being made aware of this, Ern does not change his nature, which is later exemplified in the same episode. He tells his therapist of his experience at the airport on his way to Princeton. A boarding agent refuses to let him on board due to some light damages to his passport. He claims that, although he was hurt, he no longer wants to operate in spite. He claims to recognize that his goals will not be achieved by responding to the images others have of him. This ends up being untrue. As the episode concludes, the subplot, which involved a woman abandoning her job at the airport for a publishing opportunity in children's literature, is revealed to be a ruse put together by Ern. She is the boarding agent that refused to let him on his flight. 
Everyone involved with this opportunity is in fact an actor hired by Ern in order to humiliate her and lead her into losing her job. Once again, he is acting out of spite. However, now that he's rich, he can be far more damaging in how he chooses to do so. Are you missing a pole? Doesn't quite look right. What do you think? Loves it. Which room are you gonna sleep in? This one. Oh. Which one's daddy gonna sleep in? He can sleep outside. Outside? I'll get my toothbrush. To say Ern is solely limited by a capitalist system would be an oversimplification. Perception of race, as well as moments of trauma, have created a desire to be in control and in power within Ernest. It is a very complex situation, and I'm certain there are many people better equipped to discuss the many layers to this than I am. Ern fears that the worst things that have happened to him may happen again. That's very understandable. However, in a capitalist system, power comes from capital. Therefore, Ern defines himself through his socioeconomic standing. Originally, he's defined by what he does not have. He's a low-income college dropout trying to support a child, and he feels as though this means he failed. As the series progresses, and as his cousin's public persona becomes larger, Ern's life completely changes. He becomes a very successful music manager in a large agency with big-name clients. Despite this, he's still greatly concerned with the way others view his success. The traumatic experiences he was victim to growing up and the racism he has been subject to throughout his life have left him desiring a level of control over everything happening around him, especially on how he's viewed. Ern is defined by the image he maintains in a system where capital comes before all else. In search to control the image he has within said system, he's unable to truly define himself. Instead, he becomes a response to the perceptions others have of him. The tragic part, he's aware of this. Look, man, I just don't want no janky-ass lawyer putting his hands on my contracts and checks, all right? I want, like, a high-level Jewish dude. Not somebody gonna rob me like Don King or some shit. And Don King wasn't a lawyer, I'm pretty sure. Also, Christian came highly recommended. He, he supposedly does good work. Recommended by who, man? He ain't even got no clients that make actual money. All he got is some F-level rappers and some reality TV stars. Reality TV stars, huh? So this is probably like a big level firm, man. Jewish dude. All right. Yeah. It's time to start leveling up on niggas. Gotta kick off this European too. Shit about to be real different. As both Ern and Alfred function under the capitalist system, their efforts to define themselves in the early series are through its restrictions. They search to find deeper significance in themselves, however, their efforts in doing so fall short, as these efforts don't serve this purpose. Instead, these actions serve to enrich them. For Alfred, the effort is made to have better control over his own life. He believes that this equates to controlling his career and finances. First, this leads him to expanding his wealth through Paperboy, agreeing to have Ern manage him. Feeling as though this gave him even less control, he then tries to take full control over his career. In fact, he even begins to manage. This fails to satisfy him. This leads him to recognizing that the capitalist method of defining the self through wealth will never give him deeper significance. He will remain an entity that ultimately serves to make himself and others money. By the end, he searches to define himself outside of capitalism living for himself instead of his financial needs. For Ern, this journey is different. Ern is not trying to define himself for his own needs. He's functioning in response to the view others have of the world. A view that's guided by the racist and capitalist system they function under. He therefore tries to prove that he's more than they perceive him to be by excelling within the system. So long as Ern refuses to observe himself through his own lens, he will be unable to define himself outside of capitalist restraints. 
Earn therefore fails where Al succeeds. To escape the shallow significance provided to the individual through a capitalist system, one must be ready to abandon the definition of success provided by said system. By choosing to live for himself instead of for his wealth and career, Al achieved this. On the other hand, Earn is too preoccupied by the perceptions others have of him to do so. Through the characters of Alfred and Ernest, the viewer comes to understand that the individual's ability to define themselves under the capitalist system is ultimately neutered. As capitalism defines success through one's financial status and their individuality by their career, it becomes difficult to be perceived, even by ourselves, through a different lens. The individual is therefore no longer free to define oneself, as the system they are born into limits both the experiences and actions available to them. Earn demonstrates how easy it is to let the perception created by capitalism consume us. He continuously tries to prove that he's more than he's perceived to be. Meanwhile, Al illustrates the difficulties one may have when trying to determine one's own development while operating within the boundaries of the financial model. Ultimately, he illustrates that, to properly define oneself, we must be able to refuse these boundaries and attempt to find meaning outside of our career or our wealth, a process that may not be available to the less fortunate. As Ern once said, No, no, I'm actually kind of fucked. Van needed that money. My daughter needed that money. Okay, not in September, but today. Okay, see, I'm poor, Darius. Okay, and poor people don't have time for investments because poor people are too busy trying not to be poor. Okay, I need to eat today, not in September. In the final episode of Atlanta, Van, Ern, and Alfred go to a black-owned high-end sushi restaurant. Across the street from the restaurant, visible through the window, there's the Popeyes. Though the trio want to support the new restaurant, they deeply want the fried chicken sandwich. They recognize the influence a good review from a local celebrity could have on this black-owned business, but they're overwhelmed by their desire to have the sandwich. American fast food is possibly the most iconic symbol of widespread capitalism. The fact that the presence of this fast food location completely overwhelms the thoughts of all three characters, even after one has seemingly found a way to define himself outside of capitalism, leads to the question, is there really a way out? Has capitalism become a constant even within our own thoughts?